All right, thanks for the great introduction. Um, I do wanna thank all the organizers for Ohio Linux Fest. I know that it is a um, huge lift with a very small group of um, volunteers and organizers, so thank you for that. And um, I wanted to thank um, the other speakers at the event um, and everyone who has contributed to putting on this event. Thank you to the sponsors. Um, and thank you all for coming. There would be no event if not for you. Um, I, I've actually um, only been to Ohio Linux Fest one other time, and it was um, back when I was at Linux Pro Magazine. We had a booth here, and we were a media sponsor, and I've been wanting to come back since then. Um, I like Columbus quite a bit. I actually lived here for a few years as a kid. Um, my brother was born in Columbus, and um, I remember being really cold at the bus stops. Um, <laughs> so, and I and survived the blizzard of, I think it was 78. So I do have, um, yeah, I have uh, fond and cold memories of Ohio, and uh, it's, it's always nice to be here. Um, and there are two schools of thought when starting a talk. Uh, one is to introduce yourself and talk about what you do, and then there's one that is you don't introduce yourself and don't talk about what you do. So I'm gonna take a third approach and tell you what I'm not. Um, I'm not a career coach. <laughs> and so um, you'll notice that my talk is not called, this is how you're going to steer your open source career. Um, my talk is a question I've been having with myself. I've really struggled with this the past few years. I've had a lot of career angst um, because I have been in my career a little more than 20 years now. Um, I, uh, I, I did not grow up thinking um, I'm going to go into open source someday. That wasn't a thing. Um, I wanted to be a, a journalist. And um, so that's how, that's how I started my career. But this one, um, this talk, um, I really struggled with giving this talk also like writing in and thinking about it because it is very personal for me. This is not a thing I come in with answers, but what I found is the questions I'm having about my career, being mid-career, they're, they're universal. People have them at the beginning of their careers. I'm finding a lot of people um, in the middle of their careers that are struggling with this, and I'm finding people who are older and have been in their careers longer who are struggling with these same questions because technology is just going, 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 and it's going faster than we can um, go sometimes, you know, so um, careers can be re really quite challenging in this industry. Um, but, you know, this is not the first time I've given a, a highly personal talk or written about personal things. I actually, um, uh, I, this one was harder, but I have a history of writing about things that are very personal, like when I had dogs, I wrote about my dogs. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had a Willie Nelson phase, I gave some talks, uh, uh, I uh, wrote some articles, you know, I uh, gave a uh, Ignite talk about Willie Nelson, I'm still in that phase. And then there was my Stephen King phase, uh, give him multiple talks uh, inspired by Stephen King. Um, I'm a runner, uh, I'm on a hiatus from running right now, but I've uh, had some more than one running article. Uh, my Buffy phase, that was a good one, uh, article and talk on, yeah, still in that phase. Every winter I go through a Buffy marathon. Um, and then uh, uh, back to my, I've had multiple articles on multiple websites about my pets, uh, so yeah. But this one was a little different. Um, and so when I was thinking about this talk and um, really thinking about this question I had and how would this become a talk, I thought back to, back when I was at Linux Pro Magazine, around the time I first met Beth Lynn, um, that my colleagues talked me into launching a blog on the site. and. The blog ended up being part of the thesis I wrote for grad school also, and it was um, a blog. Uh, this was uh, um, it's around 2008 or so when I launched it, and it was to highlight women's contributions to open source because at the time, you know, we were really questioning how many uh, women are in open source, what's a percentage, who counts as a woman in open source, um, and uh, so I decided, well, okay, how about, what are they doing? That's my question. What are, you know, let's say there's 2%, 5% or whatever, what are they doing? I don't feel like they're, they're getting covered and I really wanted to dig in there and find out what are uh, the cool stories of these people that are quietly just doing their cool jobs. And so I started interviewing people. And I, I interviewed uh, women in various roles, not just developers, that was my other thing, is I wanna interview and really look at the spectrum of contributions of women working in the same field I'm in. You might recognize this person, uh, interviewed Beth Lynn, uh, and talked to her um, back then uh, about Ohio Linux Fest. And so I decided for this talk, uh, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to look back, re-interview some of the people that I talked to for my uh, series back then, and then uh, interview some people that I've met since then uh, who've had long, longer careers in this field, you know, at least 10 years, that was my criteria. And I wanted to look at a, a spectrum of 
um, of careers that they've had and ask them questions about what did you think you wanted to do when you started? What, you know, how did you get where you are now and what do you think is next? And those were my big questions because these are the questions that I'm struggling with also. And then the other thing I really wanted to get out of um, this was, uh, what do I do next? You know, like, give me some advice. What's your key advice? Like, how, how do you uh, have this healthy, happy career, you know, where you're feeling satisfied and you're not struggling with this question all the time? What's your tidbit of advice? So I did ask every person I interviewed, you know, give me one or two or three pieces of solid advice that you would recommend sharing, things that you learned along the way. So, meet Emma Jane Hogben. Does anybody know Emma Jane? Uh, yeah, she, she used to speak at events quite a bit. I haven't seen her speaking a lot lately. Um, and this is a, a running photo. She's a runner. <laughs> and she also, she sews a lot too. So she's probably wearing stuff that she sewed on there. Um, so uh, I, I interviewed her in 2009. And uh, I, I wrote about what she was doing also for my series. Back then she was a Drupal developer. She actually uh, open sourced a pattern for Drupal socks. So if you've seen knitted Drupal socks uh, pattern online, that those might be the ones that she did. Um, because she has many talents. And um, she was very active in the Ubuntu community when I interviewed her. And she put on her own regional event in Canada called Hick Tech, which I thought was super cool. And it was for her, uh, her community. It was helping uh, farmers in the area learn about technologies, uh, you know, and open source options when possible also. So I uh, followed up with her recently. And um, uh, she told me that she started working in tech accidentally. Is there anybody else here who started working in tech accidentally? Okay, so I started working in tech accidentally. I, um, I started at Sysabin Magazine uh, more than 20 years ago as an editor. I thought I, I wanted to go into print publishing, and Sysabin Magazine was a journal for Unix and Linux sysadmins. Um, do we have any Unix admins in the audience? Okay, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, are you currently Unix admins? <laughs> okay, that also is what I thought would happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, Sysadmin was a print magazine. Um, are any of you getting Sysadmin now? No, it's out of print. <laughs> uh, are any of you getting print magazines now? Okay, Very, yeah, small number. If I would have asked this question 20 years ago, everyone in the audience would have raised their hand um, because back then there were lots of print magazines and that was where my career was going, was print. That was you know my goal and it happened to be, then it was like, okay, well, I'm gonna do tech print um, and that's not a thing now. So like, like, Beth, er, like a, uh, Emma Jane, my career started accidentally. And so I, ha I asked her to tell me that story. And she said in 1995, between um, high school and college, she was volunteering for a nonprofit, the Sierra Club of British Columbia. And, uh, and so we did this video interview was how I was interviewing her. And, and she said there was another volunteer and she said, um, he created a, okay, we'll call it a web page. <laughs> she goes, I think it counts as a web page. And so that was um, uh, her first experience uh, starting to learn how to design web pages. And she said that um, the, uh, the web page that he did, it was to um, show, uh, it was to, to capture what it was like in this environmentally sensitive area to help give people um, like a little tour of this area without them having to do ecotourism, you know. And so that was the kind of stuff she was interested in. And so she started dabbling in building web pages for nonprofits. And she uh, was in, then she went to college and was studying environmental science. And she said she studied a lot of fish. And then she said a lot of fish. And um, she realized that there wasn't a lot of career opportunities with this thing she'd been studying, um, whereas there were more career opportunities in this side thing she had started doing in the process of web design. And she said the switch to technology was to uh, get paid to work uh, supporting organizations that she wanted to support. She says the complementary passions helped her get her web design skills and she was mostly self-employed. She did a lot of consulting over the years. She, uh, she did tell me that she she's discovered that about herself that she was better with being self-employed and she uh, uh, mentioned that she had been fired from multiple jobs because uh, you know she was a bad fit for certain uh, organizations or or um, uh, projects at the time. But so she really has done a lot of self-employed uh, opportunities. But then she also um, started uh, speaking at events. And, it was, and that was around the time I actually got to meet her in person when she was speaking at events. And she said that the speaking at events helped these other opportunities start popping up for her. She got asked to write a book. And she got asked to write another book and another book. And um, she started doing training also. 
So here, here are some of the things that she's written. And if you uh, look on the Riley website, I think she still has some training that's up there, um, get training. Uh, and these books all did very well. I, don't, I assume they're all still out. I don't know if they're being updated still. But So I asked her, I was like, okay, so this is what, 20 years later, uh, what are you doing now? Um, you know, and she said that now she's the technical pro project manager for the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs at the United Nations. I thought was super cool. So she works with developers and sysadmins. She's not actually doing the programming now. Um, but she said, I love the variety of work that I do in open source. Sometimes it's very private work where I'm preparing a website deployment for a single client. And sometimes it's working with a community of developers to improve a product. Sometimes I'm working with a client that lives 15 minutes from me. And sometimes I'm up late talking to a client that's literally on the other side of the world. And she said um, web development was a skill that she needed to have, and that's why she, you know, she picked it up. And um, she figured out what she needed to do to accomplish the goals for the various organizations that she was supporting. And one thing she said about the humanitarian space, which is what she's interested in, uh, is that they aren't inventing the bleeding edge technology. And that was the part that she found hard keeping up with was all this, you know, the rapid pace of change. Um, they're just taking advantage of and using the technology and in ways um, that uh, are helping the clients that they're supporting. And these are, these are clients that are responding to disasters. She said, um, we're building websites that need to be mobile friendly because in Mozambique, I'm really proud of myself, I just pronounced that correctly, okay. Um, there is no internet after a hurricane comes through. So yeah, she's uh, still doing, I just think this is a really cool career choice, you know, where she's able to use this technology um, that she's picked up along the way to, to do the humanitarian and nonprofit kinds of uh, work that she wanted to do. And she said that um, having technology as a passion is fantastic, but in, in her case, she couldn't keep up. And so she's found that um, uh, th this role that combines her passion, skills, and um, experiences. And so this brings us to our first career tip. The technology does not have to be the passion. The technology can be the thing that lets you do your passion. Meet Don Foster. Does anybody know Dawn Foster? She's, yeah, she's been around the industry for a long time. Um, and uh, I've become friends with her over the years also. And she's uh, well known for communi community management, her participation in different communities and studying communities. So Dawn got started in tech a more traditional way. Uh, she went uh, to school for a computer science degree in around 1995. And she started working as a Unix sysadmin at a local manufacturing company. Uh, Dawn is from this area. She's from Ohio. She's from rural Ohio, uh, grew up on a farm. And um, the company didn't spend a lot of money on tech, so open source tools were the best options for her at the time. And so that's how she started getting in open source was solving problems for the, um, the manufacturing company that she was working for. And by two 2000, she was working at Intel, and they needed someone to evaluate open source technologies for Linux. And that was you know, where this past experience at this manufacturing company in Ohio was helping her. And um, uh, so that made her a good pick for this role. And a big part of the tool evaluation was to review the communities and the health of the communities um, and how you know, if they were supporting these technologies. And after a few years at Intel, she worked as a freelance consultant, and including, including doing uh, social media consulting back in the early days of social media. From 2010 to 2012, she was back at Intel. And she was a community manager for the Mego project, which was a new mobile Linux distribution hosted by the Linux Foundation at the time, um, and it was a partnership between Intel and Nokia. Um, does anybody remember Migo? Okay, yeah. It, it, it wasn't around super long. Uh, there were, it morphed multiple times. It had very cute character logos. Uh, and that's when I first met her was at a Linux Con event. And it was, I, we were talking about it. I think it might have been the second Linux Con event. I don't even remember where it was. Um, and uh, so uh, that was when we started covering the Migo, pro um, Migo project also and uh, covering more what Don was doing because this uh, was you know early days of um, open source and mobile and all that. So I think flip phones and Blackberry still, I don't think we had the touch screens or any of that then. So after that, she moved to um, Puppet Labs. And then, um, I always say this about her, she had the best midlife crisis ever. She's about my age, um, and uh, my, my midlife crisis is completely boring in comparison. Um, she quit her job, sold her house, sold her car. She lived in Portland, um, put what, whatever she had in storage, and she moved to Greenwich to uh, work on her PhD. And her PhD was um, studying contributions in the Linux kernel. So she, um, uh, she worked on it for about three years, and she was studying how 
um, people contributed to the kernel and um, how organizations um, supporting the people uh, affected contributions. She can describe it much better, but it was, uh, she studied mailing lists and that sort of thing. But, so she's quite the expert on communities. And now she's um, at Pivotal. She's been at Pivotal a little more than a year managing their Kubernetes com uh, contributor strategy. And she still, still spe speaks at events quite a bit. She was at um, Open Source Summit last week, which is what the LinuxCon events morphed into. Um, and so she said that I asked her what, what she wants to do next, you know, because uh, like I said, she's about my age. So I figure we've got, you know, 15 to 20 years, unless she saves a lot better than me, I guess. Uh, in our careers, you know, and so I, f I feel like I'm about at the halfway point, you know, and she said that she's done growing her career, that she's had a point, you know, where she was working her way up the ladder. She thought she wanted to be an executive. She decided that she didn't want to do that because um, she didn't uh, like the way they, they work, like the hours and the pace and the stress of it. She likes a work-life balance. And so more at a director level is something that she enjoys. Uh, she, can t she said that, you know, the manage managing people directly isn't the thing that um, you know excites her as much as working with communities and so um, she's uh, not trying to grow her career she's settled in and she's feeling really good about stuff right now and happy and so I asked her what advice she has for us and she said don't be afraid to be opportunistic uh, she and this was a, one of the patterns I noticed with the, the folks I interviewed for this talk was um, many of them just um, took opportunities that happened to cross their paths that seems like a good fit and a good adventure at the time and then she also said, especially in open source, that it helps to pick up a wide variety of skills um, along your career path. And um, I think that you probably all know that, and that's why you're here. That's where events come in. You know, you um, uh, have many opportunities to learn skills, uh, learn about things that uh, you might not know about, and meet people that will help you along the way. Um, and then I really like this because she did grow up in rural Ohio on a farm with not a lot of money, um, and uh, she said that you know, she, she would have never imagined the opportunities that a career in open source would afford her, and um, working in communities has given her the opportunity to travel. And this is one of the many things that Don and I have in common. I also grew up in the Midwest, a family that didn't travel, you know, outside of the United States. We did camping, you know, we did Colorado camping and that kind of stuff. And so uh, working in this industry has been um, just something, I, as a child, I would have ne never dreamt of opportunities to uh, go to places and, and meet these people from around the world. All right, and now let's look at um, Vicki. Vicki is not a person I interviewed back when I had my blog. I didn't know Vicki back then. I've met Vicki more recently, uh, and I don't actually remember where I met her. I think it was at a conference. I, I know the first time I really had a good conversation with her was a hallway track at a conference, um, and that's one of the best things about events, I think, is the, uh, the people you get to meet in between sessions. Um, and I was, at the time when I met her, I was working on opensource.com at Red Hat, and uh, you'll see she's wearing an opensource.com jacket in this this photo because she ended up um, doing a, a, quite a bit of writing and uh, volunteer work and participating with us on the opensource.com project. So Vicki also got into technology and open source completely by accident. Um, she has a degree in classical philology, which I had to Google after we talked. I'd never heard of that as a thing. Um, but so she's really into uh, Greek and Roman history, and she was planning on going into, um, uh, she wanted to become a professor. So she was working towards her PhD. She has multiple degrees. And um, uh, then she uh, started working at a university library in the mid-90s. And the library at the time was looking at updating their software. And so Vicki was helping them with that and uh, started working with a vendor to test software. And um, because she was the most techn technologically curious is what she described herself. And so it's not that she already had the skills. She was like, okay, I'll do it. And so she started learning that. And then the vendor liked the experience of working with her and the vendor offered her, offered her a role. And so she relocated to the Bay Area and took um, her first uh, job in tech at the time. And she decided to put off grad school and that was in 1999. And that was when she made the switch into a tech career from an academic career. She was a product analyst in her first role and she didn't know what she wanted to do next. But uh, technology was allowing her to pay the bills in academics. Uh, you know, if you're a student, you're eating a lot of ramen. <laughs> I like ramen, but still, it gets old. Um, so she said, so many people are stagnant in their careers because they don't know where they want to go. And if you come up with a plan, that's great, but be flexible because otherwise you're going to get completely derailed and it turns into this depression session. And that's a quote. 
And she says, uh, look, at his, look at it as an opportunity it is that you'd never expected. And it, at this point in the interview, I told Vicki, I was like, I totally understand because my plan was to go into print publishing and that, you know, was a sh uh, it was a great idea. I didn't know print publishing was going to get so tiny. So, um, so she was a self-taught programmer and she moved into a programming role at a different company. And that's uh, when she said uh, how much she doesn't enjoy programming. Um, so a lot of people, I think, when you're entering this industry, tell you that, you know, you have to learn programming. Uh, I've been in the industry more than 20 years. I don't program. Um, I, I'm good at languages. I like to think I could program if I really wanted to. It's just, if that's not your thing, you don't have to do programming. There are many other opportunities in open source. So she just um, decided that that was not her thing. She wasn't enjoying it and, um, and didn't, you know, she, she could get by, but it wasn't her thing. And so she said she was very lucky that she had a mentor at the time that really saw her strengths and that her strengths were more in um, a leadership role. And so um, the mentor helped move her into a director of engineering role at the, an organization. And at that point, she said she started learning more about marketing. And uh, I'm, I have been, I've worked in marketing departments off and on uh, in my career also, and uh, have a, a ton of respect for people who do marketing. And as does she, you know, she said, it's not a dirty word. Advertising can be if it's done poorly, but marketing, if done well, is the thing that's going to allow you to build the right thing for the right person at the right time. She also emphasized that she started doing community, uh, customer service and um, you know, doing the help desk stuff. And she thinks that that should be a rite of passage for every developer because it helps teach you empathy, and, um, uh, which I really appreciated that she said that. And she feels very strongly about it. Um, and uh, so she, if you haven't done customer service or done a helpline, give it a try. Uh, it might help you see your job a little differently. So she left that job to, come, to become a product manager at the Internet Archive. She had been a big fan of the Internet Archive and what they're doing. And so she said she wrote them a note and said she was interested in volunteering. And they found out a little bit more about her. And they were like, well, how about we have this position that would be good for you? And they offered her a job. And um, so she took that. And that, she said that was her first open source job um, because they, you know, they are considered an open source organization. And um, so she got laid off not long after that. And so that's where her, uh, uh, that's why she has this advice now about it's good to have a plan, um, but be willing to roll with it in this industry. And so then um, she did some freelance work and um, eventually became a manager at HP. And she was there a little while and then they started doing layoffs and she got laid off again. And so, and I, I knew her through that period. And so she spent the next few years freelancing and consulting and writing and speaking. And that was when she was doing a lot of writing for us too on opensource.com and lots of public speaking. It was helping her get clients, learn new things, build her network. And um, she wrote a book on um, forging a f your future in open source. And it's literally the book on forging your future in open source. So if you're just getting started, um, I, I did help review this. I didn't get paid to endorse it or anything, but um, I do think it's a really solid book. Um, for helping people get started with open source or to understand open source. So that's a nice manual I would recommend. Currently, she's the director of open source strategy at Juniper Networks, and she's been there, uh, I want to say about a, uh, maybe about a year now. And so I asked her, uh, and she's super excited about the new job. She loves it. She's having a great time. Um, and it's a lot of work, you know, I know, but um, she's really enjoying it and it um, plays well to all of her strengths. And so I asked her, what do you want to do next? And she wants to be the first, the world's first chief open source officer. Um, and uh, she has no intentions of leaving Juniper right now. She is very happy there. So what a career, career advice does she have? Never stop learning. Uh, you're at the right place. You're at an event, you know, a great place to learn. Books, articles. Uh, online classes, there are many opportunities to learn, but um, uh, that, that was a firm stop there, never stop learning. So I, uh, if you're in tech and you're not interested in learning and you just want to keep what, doing what you're doing, you don't have a very solid future, so uh, rethink that. She said, everyone I've seen has had a difficult time in their tech, tech career. Um, they, it was because they either got dog dogmatic about certain technology and turned away from new things because of it, or they got too comfortable where they were and they got laid off, and then they were I believed it. She has a very colorful language, and I thought it was so. <laughs> I appreciate her language, but I felt like it might uh, get me in trouble at this talk. Um, so, <laughs> all right, and meet Erica Stanley. Uh, Erica is also somebody that I did not interview back when I had my blog because I didn't know Erica yet. Uh, I, did, I met Erica at a conference, and I met her at OzCon a few years ago, and 
Um, if, if you um, are uh, a classic introvert and socially awkward and uncomfortable going up to strangers at conferences, um, I feel you, I am you, but do it anyway. I sat next to her at a table at lunch and just leaned over and we started talking and I really like her and I'm really glad I, I did that even though I, I probably was dorky and whatever, but we, you know, we're friends now and, uh, and she was um, one, giving one of the keynotes at All Things Open a few weeks ago and so I, uh, she took some time and, and gave an interview. And she, uh, and this was one of the in-person interviews I did for this talk. She is um, co-founder of um, Women Who Code, the Atlanta chapter, and it's got about, I think she said 4,000 people in it now. And so that's kind of a big deal, right? And uh, she organizes Refactor Tech in um, Atlanta, uh, and it's a, it's a tech conference. Um, and, and that event is focused on growing and showcasing powerful voices of marginalized people and allies in tech. So I'll give you a little plug for it. Uh, Again, I'm not paid for this, but I, I, um, I'm hoping I can go this year because I want to go every year, and it's um, April 22nd through 24th um, in Atlanta. And I don't know if their CFP is open yet, but um, I know she's excited about it already and talking about it. So um, she uh, told me that she got in uh, tech also in a uh, kind of traditional way. She was a gamer, and um, she went to a fine arts high school and, and has a, a background in gaming. And um, she has a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in computer science. And she was um, starting to pursue her PhD, specializing in interactive graphics. And her intention was to take a break and make money um, you know, from that because she saw all her friends were starting to work in tech while she said she was eating a lot of ramen and peanut butter and her friends were making the bank. you know, And so she decided she was gonna take a break and uh, go make some money for a while. And um, while, while she was, uh, starting to work in tech, she realized that um, she didn't, uh, for what she's interested in, she right now doesn't have plans to go back and get her PhD, maybe later, but not right now. And so um, her first project in tech was in 1999, um, working with uh, NOAA as part of the research that she was doing um, in college. And she was a research assistant and ended up working on satellite imaging. And her uh, research had her doing a lot of work in virtual reality and augmented reality, and that's um, the area that she was really interested in. And she was picturing herself um, going into gaming or 3D graphic movies like what Pixar does. So out of school, she started working in web development because uh, she said she had all these skills, um, but um, people at the time were really interested in um, her, her um, flash skills. And so she started doing um, web development for startups, um, including startups that got acquired by MySpace and Oracle. And more recently, she was working at a startup in Atlanta as an engineering manager for uh, data analytics and integrations team. And as of um, November 1, um, she said that she was going to be uh, working at um, Mozilla at Firefox Reality um, uh, on their VR and AR solution for the browser. And she said, I don't think that happens a lot, that the thing that you started thinking out you wanted doing to do ends up being the thing that you do. And I think that's true in tech. <laughs> And um, so this, this was a really great conversation because then she also talked about that she thought that early in her career, she didn't really understand the things that were important to her as a person and as a human being. And um, she said that it was very, she, you know, she was just looking at these jobs as a way, she was really focused on making money at the time, you know, because she had all this, um, you know, uh, schooling behind her and she, um, that was her goal, you know, the time was to start making some money in, uh, in her career. But she wasn't really thinking about it that when you interview for a job, you're really interviewing them also. You're interviewing the company and the people. And so she um, discovered, you know, those, because I asked her, you know, what were some of the mistakes that you made? And she said she should have been more aware of what her interests and values were at the time. And it would have helped her avoid some of the mismatches she had with some uh, teams and organizations that weren't the best fit. Um, so she said that just focusing on the money was a mistake and she, you know, recommends not doing that. And so <clears throat> what's her career tips? She said to find a group peers or mentors um, who will support you in your career. And uh, she said, don't, I really love this one. She says, don't let fear be the thing that stops you from taking something on. Um, and that means that you're probably gonna make some mistakes, you know? I mean, I, I have um, made some career decisions that, you know, didn't work out great, you know, but um, I, every, every mistake that I made uh, in my career, I would say that really, really helped me because I learned a lot more about myself, what I actually was interested in, and what I was not interested in, um, and, uh, and, and picked up new skills along the way too. All right, so um, this brings us to Kat Allman. Um, does anybody know Kat? 
Yeah, we haven't. She's been around the tech industry for a really long time. And um, she, t she was telling me that her husband recent re recently retired and he's been really trying to get her to retire. But the problem with Kat is she really is having fun. And so <laughs> she hasn't retired yet um, and she's still having a good time. So, and she has a very interesting backstory also. Um, she uh, started, uh, she, she, was, she was going to UC Berkeley and so she started with a clerical job at UC Berkeley um, and she hated it. And so she moved in and got a job in advertising um, in the advertising industry. And this is right at the cusp of when the computer industry was really starting to take off. And she, um, uh, she just had a bunch of these different non-tech related jobs. But she, um, then she said she had a job at a service bureau in, um, in a design company. And that was back when uh, they, they would charge for use of the computers, you know. And um, so her brother is very well known in tech, Eric Allman. He invented S Send Mail um, in the 1980s at UC Berkeley. And that's, uh, it helps uh, enable emails to find uh, ways to disparate ne networks, she said, so that people wouldn't have to go running up the, and down the stairs and pulling cables and whatever. So, um, so he's well known. And in uh, about 1998, he and his partner uh, launched a startup, and Sinmail Inc., and then Kat joined the startup. And uh, so I guess that's probably her first uh, real you know, uh, tech uh, role at that point. And then I met her back when she was at the USENIX or organization. And it's a, a computing organization, and she, uh, at that point, was in uh, marketing for them, I believe. And I was at SysAdmin Magazine back then, so I've known her for quite a long time. So now she's at Google, and she's in the Google Open Source Office, uh, which reports up to Chris DeBona, and she's been there for quite a while, uh, working in um, various community manager roles, um, focusing on the student programs and grants and funding. And along the way, she also worked on some of the science programs that Google does. And so she recently um, has dropped down to part time and she's working um, on uh, complete, she's moved out of the open source area and is working on uh, the science and technology area um, in a developer ecosystems group. And um, she's really enjoying it. And that's what she was saying again, you know, that um, her husband would really like her to retire, but she's just having so much fun learning. And she was telling me about some of the cool science projects. And so it's, it's, um, I find her to be very inspiring. I want to be that excited and that reluctant to retire in this industry. So I asked her, um, I was like, so look back at the beginning of your career. Where did you think uh, you wanted your career to go? And she said, I had no freaking idea. <laughs> and then she quoted her mother and she said, in the words of her mother, it's easier to ride the horse in the direction it's going. And that's what she did. She just kept getting these opportunities that sounded cool and she just kept taking these opportunities. So she wasn't consciously driving her career. Um, she was picking up these skills, having fun, getting these new roles. And this was a huge pattern I saw with the people I was interviewing for this talk. And then the other thing, um, so I asked her about career, career tips and she said imposter syndrome is real. And she said if it were actually fatal, she would have been a moldering corpse years ago. Uh, who's familiar with imposter syndrome? Okay, yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's real. <laughs> Um, <laughs> knowing about it is half the battle, but it's still, even if you've known about it for years and years, it's, it's something that, you, it's that little voice in your head that tells you you're not qualified, regardless of how qualified you are. Um, and she also said, uh, don't sweat the small stuff. And she said, if, um, so, uh, and what she was talking about, um, so if you're a person from a um, group that is not overrepresented in tech, um, you will find many reasons to be outraged in the course of your career. And this is not, these are not her words, this is me explaining this to you. And so, but her point is, um, you know, pick which things uh, consume your energy, you know, because you'll have plenty of things that are um, quite outrageous. And, um, you know, some of them can be your small stuff and you cannot let them get you down. So um, you can choose where your energy goes. Um, and then this uh, was another one that I really appreciated where she said to trust her own instincts and gut. And she said she'd, if she had trusted herself as much in her 30s as she does now in her 60s, she would have been a much happier person and more productive. So this brings me to the, the final person I interviewed for this talk, um, Erica Brescia. Um, uh, and in fact, she helped inspire this talk um, because I, I first interviewed her quite a while ago and I, and I still stay in touch with her and I'm friends with her and I've thought about her quite a bit. So she, she launched Bitnami um, in 2005 and then I interviewed her for my blog in 2004. I'd, I'd met her at a conference and uh, learned about what she was doing. And she was the CEO of Bitnami, and, um, which was called Bitrock at the time and um, you know, had, had already had uh, other roles in tech before that. Um, and so uh, I, I interviewed her for my blog and um, it, there was this one lone comment on it. 
And um, this was, you know, uh, from a decade ago. And um, people like Erica and me, uh, you know, often didn't feel like we were included as in open source because we weren't programming. And, and you still see that occasionally, you know, that people who aren't programmers, um, you know, aren't uh, considered a person in, in tech. And, you know, this person was saying I sh should have interviewed um, folks like Drew and Carla and Valerie. Um, and um, that person is right, and I have interviewed all of those folks in various, and covered what they're doing and, and worked with them in various roles. Uh, but it's like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. You can, they're all valid, they're all good, you know, and they're all making great contributions. You can like print, you can like to read stuff online. Um, you, don't, uh, you don't have to just have this narrow world view. And um, so this um, comment really stuck with me. But one of the things that Erica does, um, well, she doesn't do, she does not read comments. And so she didn't even know about this comment, which was really good. Um, but I replied to the commenter at the time, and um, I said, uh, by your definition, I suppose I don't contribute to open source either. However, if you think any person who helps educate, document, promote, market, package, and deliver open source to people contributes, then it's clear that Erica and I both contribute. I wanted to look at a variety of women involved in a wide range of contributions in open source, not just the few well-known women we might already be, be familiar with. Women are playing a bunch of really cool, interesting, unexpected roles in open source and contributing on all levels we might not even recognize. I think a lot of people are interested in hearing about women who might be flying below the radar, and I think drawing attention to the variety of contributions and the spectrum of women will help other women, people for that matter, see themselves as an important part of open source and inspire them to become more involved. Thank you, and then I climbed off my soapbox and I went back to work. But, uh, <laughs> so I've, I've thought about that a lot over the years and um, I was like, I am going to follow up on what Erica is doing now for my talk. So uh, Erica, who you know, uh, by this one person's definition wasn't doing anything, um, in addition to running a company that was employing um, dozens of people, um, she also participates in um, X Factor Ventures, a seed fund operated by female founders who are funding the next generation of female founded companies. Um, and I asked her whether she had had a hard time getting um, funding for Bitnami. And she said, the honest answer is, I don't know. She said, I heard through back channels that Bitnami had a hard time getting funding in the early days because she, she was CEO. And uh, she said she doesn't know if that's actually true. And she, but she said they, they, weren't, they didn't try to get a ton of funding, that um, they'd only gone out for funding uh, you know, one, one time, and that's when she heard those rumors. But then she said, um, I do know a lot of women have struggled to raise funding. I, don't, I didn't directly see any evidence that it was an issue for me, but I can't say that it wasn't. And she said that seeing this happen to other women did help inspire her to get involved with X Factor. And then here's an, another quote she told me was, um, the proof is in the numbers. Having women involved in the most senior levels of a company produces better outcomes. So even if I didn't care about supporting women, which I do, there's a financial argument to be made that's pretty clear. Women help build great companies that tend to be more capital efficient. And then she also explained that some of the uh, male investors, one of the reasons that females um, were having a hard time um, getting in investments was uh, some male investors don't really understand some of the businesses that um, uh, or the uh, you know uh, that they want to build or the buying patterns, and so um, women have had a hard time uh, raising money. And and uh, Erica was referring to like sexual health or um, uh, baby products and wellness products, um, and that's not all that they're funding though, because she also was talking about um, some uh, rocket thing that I didn't totally understand that sounded really cool. Um, <laughs> so she's very excited about it. And um, yeah, so she's happy to be um, funding these, uh, working in this and uh, funding the next um, generation of female founded businesses. So what is she doing now? She sold Bitnami, um, uh, she and her partners uh, sold Bitnami, uh, I think in May of this year, and she took a job as COO of GitHub, which I think is super, super cool. I'm very excited for her, I'm very proud of her. And, um, and uh, so Bit GitHub has um, more than 40 million registered users and is a home for open source developers. And she told me this is an opportunity to operate on such a completely different scale where what I can do um, has such a significant impact really on the world at this point because we all realize that software powers every aspect of our lives. She's also um, on the board of uh, Linux Foundation and she said that uh, she loves that the, the work that the Linux Foundation and GitHub is doing, uh, trying to figure out how they can ensure the long-term success and sustainability of open source and how they can use their reach via those two organizations to help companies deliver funding where it's needed to support the development of various open source projects. So what's her career tip? 
like Kat, she said, trust your gut. And I went ahead and put that on as a separate one because I just think it's so important. And um, yeah, she said that women tend to have more self-doubt around our gut, but her gut has really not failed her. And that's not just even with um, making career decisions, but she said even when she was hiring people, like she could feel if something was off and that would help her have more candid discussions with candidates about you know what they were really interested in and that sort of thing. So that was some great advice. And um, so, how will you steer your open source career? Let's look at this, uh, these tips again. The technology doesn't have to be the passion. It can be the thing that lets you do your passion. Don't be afraid of, uh, to be opportunistic and, and take advantage of opportunities that you encounter. Um, and especially, especially in open source, it helps to have a wide variety of skills. This is something that I found for myself. Um, being a generalist can really help you uh, navigate you know, changes in your organization and the industry. Never stop learning. Find a group, peers or mentors, who will support you in your career. Don't let fear be the thing that stops you from taking something on. Imposter syndrome is real, be aware of it and learn how to work around it for yourself. Don't sweat the small stuff. Trust your own instincts and gut. Trust your gut. And then I decided I would throw in one more and it's not my original one. It came from a, a running coach I had and she had very colorful language which I didn't bleep out, so if I'm in tr if I hope I, this isn't a code of conduct violation or whatever, but um, it's, not a, it's not an F-bomb, and those are the ones I usually bleep out. But So this is from my old running coach, Colleen. Don't go out like a a-hole. Um, and what she was talking about, was she's talking about marathons, and um, some of us had a tendency to run too fast out of the gate and hit a wall and be miserable for the next 25 miles. And your career is like a marathon. And so that means that you're going to need to train for it. You're going to need to rest and hydrate and eat well and take recovery days. Um, but you're also, if, if you're gonna enjoy it, you're gonna need to make some friends along the way and have a lot of fun. And thank you, that's all I have. <laughs> Uh, and it looks like we do have a few minutes to um, answer questions if anybody has questions. Either speak loud or come up here for the microphone. Any questions? Nope. Nope, we have a question. Oh, okay, that's a great question. She asked if I have any um, organizations that I would want to endorse that help um, minorities in tech. Um, well, okay, I would say I don't endorse anything um, because there are so many groups, you know, that um, I would uh, want to support. Um, Outreachy is um, a, a nonprofit um, group that um, helps uh, place, um, I believe, students uh, as interns, paid internships with organizations. Am I saying this right, Ben? Because you know what Outreachy does, yeah. And so that, and that uh, Red Hat is a big supporter of that, but I was covering Outreachy since the very beginning um, before I was part of Red Hat. And so that's a group I think for students that I would highly recommend. And then um, I, would, I would recommend looking at um, events also like uh, Erica Stanley's event. Uh, one of the reasons I'm real excited to go there is they've made such an effort to um, you know, have a very inclusive, diverse mix of programmers coming to her event. Um, if you're looking at events, All Things Open, which is in Raleigh, um, uh, I know that the organizer there spends a ton of time and energy trying to make that a very welcoming event. Um, and so I would recommend that. And then um, there are just uh, um, a lot of the, I would look at local and regional groups. And if you don't have one, I would recommend considering starting one. Thank you, that was a good question. So, any other questions? All right, well thank you all and uh, thank you for coming. Appreciate Big it. Big hand.